and uh, let's look at the, the word of the Lord this morning. You know, the past several weeks we've been studying the names of Jesus. Um, we've gone through, um, probably this is about the fifth week that we've studied, uh, we've looked at Jesus as our mighty God. Uh, we looked at him as our Prince of Peace, uh, the Savior of the world. Last week, Pastor Delson uh, taught a, a wonderful message on Emmanuel, Amen. God with us. Amen? Amen? There's so many names that we have studied so far, and each of these names gives us a grasp of some of the nature of God, uh, the character of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, on the, on the first Sunday of the new year, I, I would like to conclude this series by looking at Jesus as our Alpha and Omega. Amen. Jesus is the beginning and he's the end. Amen? Amen? Jesus finished his course. Jesus went to the cross. He, he completed the mission that God had given to him coming into this world. And he had a, a finishing spirit. You know, he, he, he stayed the course. He, he completed the race that God gave him. And I pray that you and I have a finishing spirit, that that same spirit would rest upon us as we continue to do what God's called us to do. His name is Jesus. He's the Son of God. He's our mighty God. He's our Prince of Peace. He's the Savior of the world. And today we declare He is the Alpha and Omega. In, in the book of Revelations, chapter 1, verse 8, he writes, John wrote about the proclamation of Jesus, and he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come. The Almighty. Jesus is Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning. He's the end. But He's everything in between as well. He sets things in motion in you. And He carries you to the finish line. He dissolves what needs to end. And He opens what needs to be opened. How, how many are believing for new doors this year? Amen. New doors are part of God's plan for us. <coughs> but doors, sometimes before new doors can open, sometimes old doors need to be closed. Jesus finished the great act of salvation. He paid the ransom to free us. He disarmed principalities and powers and authorities. He made a public display of them, it says in the Word. God, thank God, he finishes what he begins. I think we can be strong finishers too. Amen. But we need to develop in us a finishing attitude. We need to have a, a finishing spirit in our lives. We need to learn to press on yes. in the race that God's given to us, to be overcomers through Christ, who strengthens us. Amen. These attitudes are attitudes we need to own. These are attitudes where, where we must trust God to work out in us. In Revelation 21.6, he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. I'm going to ask you a question today. Are you thirsty? Amen. Because God has given us a promise here. In Revelation 21, 3 says, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. You think about the awesomeness of that. It's a promise that God would be with us. It's not often some far off distant thing. You don't have to look at the scars and wonder, sky, uh, stars in the skies and wonder where God is. Because His promise is to be with us. Yes. You got an empty chair near you? He's with you. You don't need an empty chair. He can still be with you. Jesus is the Omega in you. 
When you think of the Alpha and the Omega, the Omega speaks of, you know, when, when, when you look at the beginning of an end. It, it says that if Jesus is also our Omega, there are some things in us that need to finish. There are some things in us that need to end. It speaks of a, a closure. So, something that's done, something that's complete, something that's been checked off, something that's final. Or in French, fini. We need to let Jesus put his omega work in us and finish what he started. Jesus wants to put an end to your deep wounds. He wants to put an end to your broken heart. He, he wants to put an end to our mistakes, our, our negativity. He wants to put an end to unforgiveness. There's some things we need to let go and just say omega to those things. It's done. It's finished. Sometimes when I, when I counsel people, not, none of you of course, this is other people that I counsel, you, know, you, you identify some things that need to die. You know what I'm talking about. There's some things that need to die in our lives and, and, and they keep saying, but... Or give some excuse to that thing that needs to die. And, and instead of letting it just die, we keep resuscitating the thing that needs to die. It's like the old man rise up and come on up. You know, it's like we, we just, he's died. Breathe some life into that old man. No, the old man needs to die. Let it die. Let, let the, the, that chapter of your life be settled. Let the book of that part of your life be closed. Uh, not to be brought back again. It needs to be forgotten. Omega can be a finishing season. It, it, it's a, a chapter that is over. It, it might be a bad thing you experienced. Maybe it's holding on to something that you've been holding on to that suffocated you for so long. It's time for you to move on. It's time for you to close that book. You can exchange the Omega for a new Alpha in your life. Amen. You get rid of this ending so that you can have a new beginning. You know, you've got to ask yourself the question, what hinders my life from possibility? Sometimes it's the framework of an old assumption. Old ways of thinking, old patterns of life, old habits that you settled into. You know, these are things we seem to carry on with us. And, and, and in framing with our future, what we're doing is we have this old assumption that, that's evolving out of older beliefs that they're not correct. And some of the conditions of the past, and we carry this whole thing like Linus's blanket. You, you know what I'm talking about? You're carrying it with you. It's something that needs to die. Amen. It's something that needs to end. You allow yourself to, to shrink, and you live in a rut of sameness. No change. I see so many people wishing everybody Happy New Year. Hoping it'll be a new year. But they don't change their mind. They don't change their habit. They don't change their way of life. They don't change what they put their trust in. They, their trust is in the same old thing. They're doing the same old thing. They, they continue in the same old way. Just hope it's going to turn out better. I mean, if you, you made a pie, and you made a pie a certain way all the time, and it tasted lousy, <laughs> would you make it again, thinking this time it's going to be good? Come on, come on. Just keep making it, and keep making it, hoping it's going to be good. No, you've got to change the ingredients. <laughs> Sometimes we just don't break out because we're doing things that maybe seem illogical to us because they're too out of the normal, at least what we've considered to be normal. You don't want to make a shift in your thinking. And you don't want to see things from a different perspective that would lead you to a different outcome. No. We don't want to break out of the frame, old frames of our mind or define those things that keep defining us, those things that keep limiting us, those things where we can maybe begin to actually see some possibility. Jesus is not just the Omega, the end of things, he's also the Alpha. 
in you. When you think of Jesus as the Alpha, He's the first. He's the beginning. You know, the, the beginning. He's the new work that God wants to do in you. Paul wrote to the Philippians, he said, being confident of this very thing, that He, Jesus, who has begun a good work in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I, I like the way the message translation puts it. There has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the very day that Jesus Christ appears. Amen. What He began, He will finish. Right. Alpha could be the dream seed. The, the first dream, the first vision that God gave you. Jesus is ready to birth something new in you because the Alpha of Jesus is the new. He's the new world of possibilities. I want you to understand, I'm not talking about some kind of pie in the sky. You know, people are going to be preaching today all these kind of things about, you know, something that's out beyond your reach. Everybody's going to forget next week what they preached last week. I'm saying that there is something substantial that all of us can enter into today. Amen. You don't have to wait for some kind of, you know, stars to line up in the sky and some other kind of thing to happen. You know, everybody's wishing for the mega bucks. They're wishing for some kind of thing, some kind of thing out there that's going to change their life. And Jesus says, no, it's not what's something out there that's going to change your life. It's what's in here that's going to change your life. Amen. I am the new possibility in you. <laughs> it's important that today you and I put off our limitations. The world. The world of the old. Because today is a new day. Yes. Today is a new day in the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, The old has passed, and behold, the new has come. The old things have gone away. Look, new things have arrived. Another translation said, what was old has disappeared. Now everything has become new. I want you to think about what this word tells us. That how do you live in the new? The, the new is to live in a dynamic relationship to Jesus Christ. He promises us, us a new covenant. It's not the old covenant, it's a new covenant. He promises a new heart. Not the old stony heart that we once had, but it's a, a new heart. He tells us that you're not the old creation, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen? He's offered us new life, eternal life. That means that you and I can encounter Jesus in a real, authentic, living, and a fresh relationship. It starts with salvation. It starts with our heart transformation. Yes. If, if I believe in Christ, I trust in Him. And He does a, a new work in me. You know, I'm not the same old person or with, with some kind of a mind bent. I wonder how many people are walking in churches like you walked in today. We're just sort of a, a mind bent towards the things of God, but never really a heart change to the things of God. I mean, you know, they, they, they're sort of walking in the religious mode, but not really in a transformational mode. Yeah, they're walking and knowing some of what the Bible says, but never the power to do something in them so that they can express what the Bible says. It starts with, a, with salvation. It starts with a heart transformation. But then it's furthered by the loving and living of Christ in our lives. He is our helper. He is our strength. He's our guide. He, he's this real. He's a living person. It says in Re Revelations 3.20, I stand at the door and I knock. 
If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, yes. I'll come into him and dine with him and he with me. You think about this. How many times has he <coughs> knocked? We either haven't heard or we haven't opened. Two things. Have, have we quieted ourselves down enough to hear, first of all, that he's approaching? And once we do, there needs to be an opening of the door. There, there are sometimes there's paintings of this that are shown where there's no knob on the outside. There's only a knob on the inside. Jesus knocking on the outside. This is a door that only you and I can open. It's a lot different than there's other situations in our life that only He can open the door. Amen? And that's the door of salvation. Where we must open ourselves. He's the one that needs to do the work in us. In Christ we are justified. It's not what you do. It's not the works you do. In Romans 5.1 it says, We have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ we're forgiven. In Ephesians 1, 7, 8 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood for the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. We are made righteous through Christ. We are forgiven yes. by Him. And we are in Christ, which means He lives through us. In Galatians 2.20 it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. Can I say this? In Christ is the new. You're not going to find any new any other place. New life, new direction, new motivation, a new you. Yeah, everybody wants to sell you some bottle of something that you drink and it'll be a new you. It'll be the same old you. You're going to think the same way. You're going to act the same way. You're going to be unforgiving the same way. You're going to do all the rotten things the same way. That bottle of something you're going to drink, the pills that you take, whatever it is, that won't bring you a new you. The only thing that can make you a new you is Christ in you. What's this new life look like? What's this new direction that he wants to bring us? What's the new motivation? First thing is we have to embrace the gospel. It's the gospel that brings life to us. And then, and then we, we embrace water baptism. Why do we embrace water baptism? Because we're making a visible sign of the commitment that we have. We're identifying with the Savior. We're identifying with His teaching. We're identifying with Him as the teacher. We're identifying with the people of God. Why? We're, we're making this commitment openly that we're going to live in the new. It requires us putting off the old man. And all the vices. You know what I'm talking about. There's, there's things that need to die. He, he, he's the, not only the Alpha, he's the Omega. There's some things that need to die. Paul tells us we need to put it off. How do you put it off? How do you put it to death, those deeds of the flesh? We have to live in the Spirit. We, we need to put on the new man. That's a choice that you and I have to make every day. Just like you get up and get dressed every day, you have to get up and get dressed in the Spirit. There, there, there's an inviting of the Lord. There, there's an, you know, asking Him that, that we make this commitment to His Word, that we ask the Lord to say, speak to me. Change me. Put on the new virtues by being devoted to the Word of God. Like, like Psalm 1 that talks about the man. That, where did he position himself? He didn't go standing in the wrong council. Did he go sitting in places of judgment? No, he stood by the river of the water where, where, where there was something that was flowing freely that brought life to him. That even in the time of drought, yeah. his leaves then dry up. We make a commitment to, to renew our mind. Romans 12 says, you, you, you present yourself as a, whole, as a living sacrifice unto God. Don't, don't be conformed to this world's way of thinking, but be ye 
transformed. How by the renewing of your mind? You know, you, you can't just watch, you know, what you think. You, you, you watch these programs on television and think somehow you're going to think properly. All it is, is it's always an appeal to the flesh. You get a supplement in the mail. What's it doing? All of a sudden you start looking at that and you're finding the things you want to buy. You didn't know you needed to buy those things until so you saw that supplement in the mail. Isn't that true? You go shopping, you walk down the mall, and all of a sudden you see these things in display windows and you start lusting for the thing that you don't have, but you don't need. You already can't fit the clothes in your closet. We have our mind renewed. Our mind needs to change. You know, we, we've been programmed certain ways. It's a, it, it's, it's a climb to the top, uh, throw somebody else down to get there. That's the way the world works, but that's not the way Christ works. He wants us to order our homes consistent with God's created design. How, how we operate in our families, how we operate in our church. It's all part of what being walking in the new is. He wants us to make a commitment to, to the local church. Why? Because the church is the pillar and the support of the truth. It's founded on the doctrine of the apostles that have been received from them. I don't know why we kind of put some of these things off to the side. You know, oh no, we're still waiting for, you know, you're going to give me some kind of a big thing out here. You know, we're, we're praying for the year of Jubilee. You know what the year of Jubilee is? It's forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Just forgive and release and you'll be living in the year of Jubilee. Amen. You know, we're, we're waiting for these big things to happen out here and he's saying, look, just put off the old man. Put on the new man. Get your mind renewed. Start to live in relationship in your home like God has called you to live. Yes. Make a commitment to the local body, the, the church that God has put you. Why? Because we are to demonstrate that truth in our community. Yes. All of us do our part in the one another ministries, you know, love one another, serve one another, you know, build up one another, encourage one another. You, you begin to do that because what happens is that you, you find out how God can use your giftings. You develop relationship in the church that's characterized by brotherly love. An acceptance and a respect for one another. Each one purposely being diligent to building up the unity and the bond of peace. I haven't given you any space shot stuff yet, have I? What well, we're talking about walking in the new. What does it take to walk in the new? Have a relationship with the world that's characterized by respect for government, employers, and other authorities as we do love and good works to those around us, the neighbors that are in our need, in need. We, we, we walk in the new by leading sober and responsible lives. Working hard. Oh, wait a minute. I'm supposed to take that back. Working hard. Providing for our own families. Making the most use of our time. Being alert. Watching out so that we don't fall into the trap of the enemy. This, this is what walking in the new is about. We're not, we're not waiting for something, you know, to happen. All of a sudden, you know, hey, hey, the moon's lined up with the sun, and, you know, and, and, and now it's raining cats and dogs, and literally, and, you know, we're, we're doing this. And Are you tired of that kind of stuff? I, I'm looking at people preaching stuff, and I'm saying, where's the substance of what you're saying? you you got this prophetic word that's, that's nebulous that nobody can ever hold you accountable for. Come on. The meat of God's Word gives us something to walk in every single day of our lives. If we want to walk in the new, we need to rebuild our prayer altar. We need to share Christ and disciple others. And that implies something, you know. It implies that you are being discipled also. Amen. This new requires a renewed commitment to the Lord's house. I don't know what's happening in our day, but, I, but this is happening in every church. Every pastor that I talk to. It, 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 there, there's a less and a less and less of a commitment to the, to the church. Is it because you can get the message later on on the, uh, on the TV? 
What is it? Because, you know, have we lost perspective of what the house of God's about and how, how we're a committed family of families, how we can encourage one another? You, you might be able to get this message taped later on, but it's not the same as being together with the body of Christ. It's not the same as praying for one another, encouraging one another, coming together. It, it says in Psalm 26, 8, Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house. I mean, think about that. Is that in our spirit? In the place where your glory dwells. Now, I understand that the glory doesn't dwell in a building. The, the glory dwells in people. But what happens when the people of God come together? What happens about the glory there? Psalm 27, 4 says, One thing I have desired of the, of the Lord, and that will I seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord, all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. You know, David's right here. He's saying, this, this is just, you know, it's so deeply embedded in me that every single day I, I want to experience God. Psalm 42, 4. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with, with a voice of joy and praise with the multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. Now, I don't know, the psalmist at this point is in a place where he can't go. So, sometimes, you know, you, you get shut in. It, or, or sometimes there's circumstances where, where you're away from. You know, it, it, they could have been imprisoned. And, and he's saying in his own mind, he's saying, declaring, his, I'm remembering those things. I, I'm pouring out my soul within me because I used to go with the multitude. I, I can remember, he's saying, when I used to be able to go and, and just pour out my heart and, and, and go with the, the voice of joy and the voice of, of praise. And I'd be with a bunch of people as we went up together. Psalm 55, 14 says, We took sweet counsel together and walked to the house of God, to the throng, to the throne. You think about it, you know. They, 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 they were in conversation together as they were coming together. Psalm 122, 1 says, I was glad when they said to me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Yeah, what do you see in the, in the heart of the psalmist? There's an excitement about going to church. There's an excitement about gathering with God's people. I want to ask you this question. Maybe I have a lot of questions. What would 2016 be like if we did some of these things? If you finally put to death those things that need to die in us, if we finally put them to death, what would 2016 look like? What would it look like if we begin to live in the newness of the life that was promised to us by Jesus Christ? What would happen if we re-established personal discipline in our life? Reading the Bible, praying, you know? What if we made a commitment to be involved in attending church? That we made it an important part of our lives. Well, what if we consistently participated in a small group like, like we have with, with, with learning the first principles? We're going to be starting next Wednesday, not this Wednesday, next Wednesday, right at the beginning of the first principles. A, a great, great opportunity to make a decision for this year that I, I want to be discipled. I want to walk through with others and as we discuss and, 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 and go through that. We're, we're, doing, we're only in the second book on a Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. Great opportunity for anybody to jump in. What would happen if, if we made a consistent effort to participate like that? Where we can actually steward the deposit of God for others and for the generations that will follow us. What would happen in 2016 if we begin to understand the value of the one another's of ministry? Of our corporate life? Where we, we come to bless, we come to give, we come to encourage, we come to exalt, we come to empower, we come to strengthen. It's not like you're, you're not just coming to get something, you're coming prepared to give. You spend time in your own prayer altar saying, what is it, Lord, you want me to give today? I'm open, I'm a vessel. What would 2016 look like? If we allowed God's life-changing principles to change us in such a way that it changes our families. 
And it changes our church. And it changes our witness. Instead of sameness, wouldn't we be experiencing newness of life? Wouldn't there be something taking place, bubbling up? And would we see Jesus, and, and, and not only as the Omega, but also as the Alpha in our life? All of a sudden, things would become new. Wouldn't others begin to see the life of Christ in us? Wouldn't a changed life be contagious? I know I asked you a lot of questions. Isn't it come down to the choice being ours? Amen. Even though the choice is ours, each choice is not equal. One choice conforms to Jesus' will and to His way. The other choice conforms to our will and our way. Might I even suggest that doing things your way is actually rebellion against God? You know that rebellion doesn't merit any blessing by Him. He resists the proud, but He lifts up the humble. He gives grace to the humble. Only we can choose His way. If we choose His way, we begin to walk in the newness of life that He's promised us. There's two possibilities. But I can tell you this, there's two vast outcomes, different outcomes from those choices. 2016 is here. It can become an unforgettable year. Think about it. If we do things His way. If we allow His newness in our life. He will complete in us what He begins. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. He's the beginning. And He's the end. The choice is ours, isn't it? I don't think we're having to wait for some great revival to hit. I think we only have to obey what He's already given us to do. And we will experience revival ourselves. Amen. And if we experience revival, it will affect those around us. Amen? Amen? So the choice is ours. If we come around to 2017, and by God's grace we're all still here, the question has to be, how was 2016? How did we respond to what God has already given us to do? I remember, I'll just say one of my kids, I won't say which one. <laughs> Why do you have to keep telling me the same thing? I said, well, when you do the first thing that I told you, I can tell you something new. Amen. Why would God need to tell us something new? Come on. Let's do the first things first. Amen? Yes, amen? And then we can look for something new. Amen. The Lord bless you as we come to this new year. But I really want you to ponder this thought. How could this year be different if I can really see Jesus as the Alpha and Omega of my life? There's something new for you, but you've got to put to death something old. There's a door that needs to close so that the door that can open can be fruitful. Amen? Amen? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this new year. We thank you, Lord, that your word is truth. And Lord, that I'm not just hurrying up my life thinking about something that's got to happen months from now. We can enjoy today. Because it's your day. It's a day that you've made. It's a day that you've given to us. Lord, let your grace that's necessary to shape our lives today be evident in our life. And Lord, those areas that we need to make some choices, 
But we need to close some doors on things. We need to put to death some things in our life. May we trust you to do that work in us. And Lord, give us a new recipe for that bad pie so that we can actually experience the blessing that you want us to. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.